Welcome to Lincolnshire Living. In today's programme, we're going to be looking at what's been happening in our region and meeting some fascinating people. So, what's coming up in today's programme? We'll be looking at complementary medicines, looking at the nationwide project Young Enterprise, celebrating Anzac Day with veterans from Waddington, and meeting Holly Arnold, an extremely talented young athlete. Have you ever considered what goes on in the day in the life of a firefighter? Well, we spent the day with Rich Johnson and the rest of the White Watch team as they completed their daily tasks and attended a rather unusual call out. Shift starts at nine o'clock on the day shifts, uh, six o'clock for the evening shifts. Once we've uh, started our shift, our officer in charge will detail us as to where we're riding, which engine we're on, whereabouts we're riding on the engine. Then it's all a case of putting our fire kit on so that we're ready to go. Because from nine o'clock, from the moment you start at nine o'clock, you've got to be ready to attend any incident. And the beauty part of the job is you never know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen or what you're going to turn out to. After the parade, it's time for a brief with watch manager Paul Dean. During the brief, Paul outlines the day's activities. One of the first and most important parts of the day are the routine drill exercises. Yeah, well, the first drill we're doing is uh, simulating a small fire within a building. Uh, the access we've deemed to be a bit too difficult at the minute, which is why we've got this ladder up to the uh, second floor of the tower. And once that's in place, as you can see, we're actually getting the hose reel to work off the ladder into the building. Because what we're saying on this incident is the building's not safe to go into. Right, now what we're simulating here is a slightly larger fire and this time it's in the building. Uh, we have to make sure this building's safe to go into before we actually do enter it. So as you can see, we're getting the hose, reel to, the hose to work off the ladder into the building to dampen the fire down. Once that's in place, they're gonna make their way up the ladder and enter the building and work their way down to the second floor. As you can see from this drill, what they've done, they've actually entered into the uh, second floor and made their way down to the ground floor with a simulating a rescue within a mine shaft type uh, scenario. Now once they're down there, they've got the stretcher to actually bring the casualty out. Most of the jobs we actually get, um, I'd say they're probably rubbish fires. By that I do actually mean literally rubbish. Uh, bonfires, wheelie bins set on fire, piles of rubbish. They'd say they're the majority of, of the call outs these days. Um, because of all the community safety work that we do nowadays, house fires are, numbers are dropping lower and lower. Uh, that's because we are more of a proactive service now. We do get the odd serious job, and um, now we've been to quite a few house fires. Um, we've had a person's reported as well, and uh, get quite a lot of um, RTCs now as well, which is more common than, than the house fires, really. Uh, they could be called out to absolutely anything. Uh, I've been in the job for nearly 30 years now and one of the main aspects that always gets me is the fact that I don't know what I'm going to from one minute to the next. Every time I come on duty I could be going to something I've never seen before. When we look at what we go to, fires, well that's obviously, everybody's mentioned road traffic accidents, but go back a year ago when all the floods were on, uh, there were places where you wouldn't think that people were going to get flooded out. Uh, just about half a mile down the road, you would never think there's going to be a flood there, but it was flooded out. And so we have to go there, use equipment we've got to actually help the people. The main call out was quite unusual, but all the same fell within the fire and rescue services remit to attend. They were sent to rescue a little girl who was trapped in a plastic toy. The rescue involved using cutting equipment to set her free. Once the little girl was safe and the details recorded, the crew returned to the station. Well done. Next on the agenda for the day was community safety work. My name is Lawrence. Yes. It's five again. Yes. Uh, One of the key areas that has changed, which I think is a very good thing, is how fire services as a whole are now far more proactive um, in dealing with fires and fire situations. And this means will advise people on how not to have a fire before they have one. There is little rest for Rich and the rest of the team. With the community safety work done, it's time for PT. PT is a time allowed for fitness and study. For Rich, this time is important, as to pass his probation period, he must successfully complete his MVQ. 
when we do get new recruits on watch, they undergo a MVQ training system, uh, which is a vocational based training system, which means we've broken the job down into eight separate aspects for firefighters. Uh, three of those aspects are operational, uh, which is rescues, uh, chemical incidents, road traffic crashes, fires. Uh, the rest are all to do with community safety, serving the public, uh, because the fire service as a whole is now far more proactive in preventing incidents than it was before. In terms of progression or not progression, uh, literally it's up to you where you want to go and uh, what your capabilities are. Uh, everybody in the fire service from, everybody with an operational input to the fire service, that's from firefighter where Richie is now, up to the chief fire officer, uh, have all been probationary firefighters on station. So to me that is a really good thing because it shows that the people on the top are aware what's happening on fire stations. I think the reason I chose to join the fire service is I made the decision when I was a very small boy. It's, it's like every small boy's dream, isn't it? Join the fire brigade, be a policeman, be a train driver. And uh, I was one of the few who managed to follow my dream and do the only job I've ever really, really wanted to do. I think the best part about the job is, certainly at the moment for myself, it's a challenge every day. Um, learning all the equipment, getting to groups with it. And also you never know, you never know what's going to go on. You know, as I'm as I'm studying, giving this this talk to you, the bells could go. And that's it, and we don't know what we're going to turn out to. Well, the best things are um, the reason why you're joining. That's to go to the operational incidents and um, be there to help people and rescue people, and that that's the best side of the job. Obviously, the downside to that is you do get people that, um, especially casualties, people that have died, and that's the worst side of the job. But but it, luckily they're few and far between now. There's not really a worst part to the job. It does get frustrating when people deliberately call us out to false alarms. Um, okay, if false alarm with good intent, you don't mind, because the intent's there, someone genuinely thinks there's something going on. But if someone deliberately calls us out falsely, that does get very frustrating. Now I joined the job in the late 70s, and the reason I joined the job was to actually save people's lives. And I think if you go and ask any one of my crew out there to say, why did you join the job? It'd be for that same reason, because they help people out. They like helping people out. They're there to save lives. With the station prepared for the oncoming watch, Rich hangs up his uniform ready for his next shift. Whether it's back pain, insomnia or stress, complementary medicines can offer that extra bit of help alongside more traditional medicines. We wanted to find out about the services and techniques available in our area. Complementary therapies and medicines are now widely used throughout the UK. There are a range of therapies, techniques and medicines available. And I've spent some time at Earth Energies in Scunthorpe to find out what the clinic has to offer. Acupuncture is a popular, if not scary looking, complementary medicine and we've come along to talk to Janet Mort today. Now Janet, yes. can you tell us how does it actually work? The idea behind acupuncture and Chinese medicine is that everything in the body is connected, all part of a greater whole. Mm. Ill health is about imbalance in the body. You can get imbalance anywhere mm. and what acupuncture is doing is finding out where the imbalance lies and helping the body naturally to correct itself. Can you tell us what Jean's symptoms were and how you're going to treat them? Absolutely. Um, Jean has had problems with sinuses for a long time. Mm. She's also had other problems with like sciatic pain and things like that which we have treated very successfully and she's fine now. But recently she had an operation on her sinuses and to help unblock and to help with this right. mucus. And it caused a great deal of pain and discomfort afterwards, didn't it, Jean? It was quite horrible. My name is Jean Taylor, and I've been having acupuncture since August of last year. I was coming here to see Jan regarding my weight, and I happened to mention that I had problems with my sinuses, and uh, she suggested that um, acupuncture could help me. The needles didn't bother me at all. I've got to admit, I was very uh, dubious about acupuncture. Uh, but it has really, really helped my symptoms. I'm just, well, I'm completely surprised actually. I was amazed. What we were going to be doing with Jean today is looking at certain channels in the face 
that we've got here, which we're going to be working with, and tapping into these channels to help with that nerve pain and to help move on the mucus that is still a little bit stuck there. So we'll be doing predominantly on the face to help with that, the whole face and sinus area. Mm. We'll also be doing certain points on the wrist, which are for general well-being, but also for pain relief. Mm. And a couple on the legs as well. Some of them are fantastic for moving any damp or mucus. Some of them, again, good for pain and a couple of little hormone things thrown in mm -hmm. for good measure. Mm -hmm. Janet went on to show us how the needles were used. I'll put the guide tube in the correct place and just tap the needle in like that. There. Right. And that's and it. And that's, doesn't, that's not, wow. You can pretty much go to a Chinese acupuncturist with anything. Really? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's almost no conditions that acupuncture can't potentially help with. So you have an awful lot of hormone related things. Yeah. It's fantastic for um, periods and PMT and all of that sort of stuff. This one's called Large Intestine 4. And this is incredibly good for pain relief. So much so that studies have even seen changes in the brain in certain transmitters with MRI scans and oh, whatnot. that's right, because it, uh, isn't there, there's an old wives' tale, or maybe it's not an old wives' <laughs> tale, that if you have a headache or... You, that's you it, it isn't an old wives' tale, it comes from minutes. traditional Chinese medicine. Wow. I do work with ladies and couples that are on IVF treatments. Mm. And I don't know whether you know about IVF treatments, but they have embryo transfer. You know, yeah, they yeah. After, when, the, when the embryo is grown, it needs obviously to be put back in. Yeah. Now, research indicates that if you have acupuncture 25 minutes before and 25 minutes after embryo transfer, that the chances of success are significantly increased. That's fascinating. So I quite happily go to the hospital with the, with the couples, and providing the hospital is in agreement, and most hospitals are. Yeah. And um, so far, the vast majority of my patients have been very successful mm -hmm. in that area. Excellent. So that is fantastic. Brilliant. When I got pregnant, you have to stop taking herbal medicine in um, cases any damage caused. Um, part of my immune disorder is aching joints, and um, the acupuncture said she could help with that. And also, acupuncture can help maintain a pregnancy. So that's why I transferred from one to the other. I didn't know what to expect. I was scared of the needles, um, the pain of them going in really, oh. what it would look like. But once I'd had it explained through Jan and she'd explained how it all worked and the initial needle had, had gone in, it was fine. <laughs> Earth Energies have a wide range of complementary medicines and treatments available for those who'd like to try an alternative for symptoms and complaints. Pupils at Tollbar School have been taking part in a nationwide project to set up and run their very own businesses, just as it would be done in the real world. Ooh. Young Enterprise gives business skills of a wide variety of areas uh, to these students, um, a whole range actually, uh, right from working together as a team, building each other, understanding problems and how to get over them, instead of just thinking, gosh, that's a problem, it's potentially an opportunity. Um, so it's, it's understanding how sales works, how promotion comes together, how the whole marketing operation works, and also how to produce things in a coordinated manner. So uh, Young Enterprise's mission is to inspire and equip young people to learn and succeed through enterprise. And that is our main aim. So as they do take part in our programmes, we hope that they'll develop themselves in a way that's going to make them have the attitude and the skills for the world of work that help them to get a job, um, just be a, a different person from when they started doing our programmes as well as, as well as the knowledge they've learnt along the way. I think it's about developing themselves as people really, which is just brilliant. Um, Young Enterprise is something we've been involved with for quite a few years company programme in particular for about the last five or six years has run successfully in the school and the last couple of years we've seen a, a significant increase in the interest from students as well. Uh, last year we had over 100 students attended a, uh, a session that we run just to try and establish interest in Young Enterprise and that led through to about five or six teams which initially set up. 
Now we're down to four and one in the sixth form, but they're very, very strong teams and it's proven to be another successful year. Hi, I'm Emma, Sales Director, and this is our team, Pulse. Hi, I'm Laura Marshall, and I'm the Finance Director. Hi, I'm Amy Swales, and I'm the Marketing Director. Hi, I'm Emily Morgan, and I'm the Secretary. Hi, I'm Rosie Hewitt, and I'm Managing Director. Well, at first, it was very overwhelming because we didn't know what we were going to do. It was like there were so many different products that we thought of, but then in the end, we came up with this one. Our product is quite unique and saleable because it's handmade and no one has thought of it and it's environmentally friendly. We make it by using MDF wood and Emily and Rosie at the moment are cutting up the wood so we can stick it on. I think we've learned quite a lot of skills because like actually like cutting the wood and learning how to actually make it and stick the corks on in different ways and we've tried different ways of doing it. We can use it as a notice board or putting hot pans on or hot um, materials and um, also a, we do small coasters or placemats. I think we made a good achievement because we did win Best Products Award and we got nominated for all the other awards. So one of the key things I've focused on with Pulse is to get them to work as a team um, and, and that's one of the biggest benefits of, of what I add to the team really. Oh, it's very important to get them organised together. They're literally you know, two, three, four years away from going into a business or, or becoming employed by a company or even set up one of their own companies. So actually to actually see how a, a, an organisation or a company can work together is, is fantastic and a very good point for them to sell when they actually go for that interview on that first job. The sorts of things that um, the students can improve on are, is definitely self-confidence and um, also I would say thinking for themselves, taking the initiative um, being responsible for their own company is a fantastic thing. Uh, I think enterprise education is particularly important because nowadays there's a, a big emphasis on qualifications and we're a very successful school in achieving high standards and GCSE outcomes. But that only is part of the skill that students need. Uh, they need to be enterprising, they need to be able to take risks and show initiative to be successful in the workplace. So enterprise education is, is very important. I'm Bethany Hudson and I'm Managing Director of Charming and um, as you can tell from my board we sell Easter related products um, but it, it alters through the year because at Valentine's Day we sell Valentine's Day um, products and our next venture will probably be Father's Day. Last month we went to a national tr uh, trade fair in Freshly Place in Grimsby and we won Best Trade Stand. We were also shortlisted for the other two awards, Best Sales Team and Best Product Qu Quality. This is our product, you get an Easter egg and an Easter teddy and a card for 3 99 which is actually quite a bargain. Went to a trade event in Leeds last week and we hope we sold, we sold really well and we also plan to go to Stratford next week of Saturday and so hopefully do well there as well. All the groups continue to impress us and the school themselves right up to the principal is very very proud of, of what they achieve. It gives great publicity to the school when they're featured on things like this and, and in, the, in the newspapers and th they walk around school with their chest pump, pumped out because they're very proud to be involved in this. Um, so every one of them that participates and those that go to the trade fairs and the, and the presentations uh, just represent the school very well and very proud of them. Anzac Day is celebrated on the 25th of April to commemorate the lives of the Australians and New Zealanders whose lives were lost in the Second World War. We spent the day with some veterans from Waddington, squadrons 463 and 467, who hold this day even closer to their heart as they were placed into squadrons with Australian servicemen and women. Today commemorates Anzac Day when we remember the landing in Gallipoli on the 25th of April 1915 when a large contingent of Australians landed to a difficult landing and there was a battle in which so many of them were lost. And it became the marker for Australians of them coming to help the mother country um, and the sacrifice that they were willing to give. My involvement today is through my father who served on 467 Squadron um, as a ground engineer and he went on to rediscover his aircraft in 1969 where it was a gate guard at Scampton. Uh, the reason why his aircraft was kept and not scrapped at the end of the war was because during the war it completed an astonishing 137 ops, which was completely unheard of. And it was also the first Lancaster to make it to 100 ops out of over 7,000 that were built. Sadly, I lost my father a few years ago, but we've had the Battle of Britain Memorial flight 
fly over today as it does every year on Anzac Day, um, flanked by a Spitfire and Hurricane. And these aircraft are, are there as a permanent flying operating memorial to all those airmen that lost their lives during the war. And I think it's fair to say that a little, little piece of my father gets airborne every time that aircraft does. Well, it, it, it's uh, of course the Australians, uh, they, they do this, and the New Zealanders, of course, and, and they do it in a very big way. They spend a, a, a lot of time and energy on celebrating Anzac Day on the 25th of April every year. And uh, if you go to Australia, you'll see all sorts of parades of children, and they're all involved, and it's, a, it's quite a big thing in Australia. Here, of course, we are virtually the only people that celebrate it because we were with the Australian, two Australian squadrons here at Waddington. Well, we were fortunate, being English, that we were placed on an Australian squadron. So half the crew were Australian, half the crew were British, four Australians, three British in the crew. And it's a bond that stayed there ever since. We've visited each other's homes. They've come from Australia to England. We've gone from England to Australia. And we're still in contact. And we still have six members of the crew alive after seven. And probably the only crew left that's got six members. Well, Anzac Ray means strictly a selfish motive because we didn't know an awful lot of other crews. But our Anzac Day for me is this particular gathering here when I hope to see, first of all, Bob and then um, Basil, the engineer. And from then we, we learn how the lads are in Australia are still alive. Uh, it's nearly always been very happy relationships that we have, but recently we've heard that the skipper has now got dementia. Uh, even so, we do speak to the navigator who is 88 and in reasonable health, and we talk to Archie. So as you can imagine, that is the big meaning of Anzac Day. From a personal point of view, I feel it's um, very, very important for the younger generations to keep the uh, memories of all those that lost their life on Bomber Command alive, A, because it's a part of our history, and B, because those children that are, that are up and coming today can learn lessons from that part of history to make a better future. It's important to the veterans to remember because memories through the years don't get weaker, they get stronger. Um, as people begin to see what happened from more and more sides and they need time to share together and come to terms with this, the, the tragedy of what was required of them in the Second World War. Holly Arnold is an extremely talented young athlete who competes in both able and disabled athletics locally and nationally. At the age of just 13 she has many gold medals, trophies and has smashed several records. We spent some time with Holly to find out just what it takes to be a junior athletic star. was born with her right hand uh, missing just below her elbow. She's always been very sporty, sort of playing sport with her older brother, um, but I think she must have been about eight or nine and she started going to an athletics club and that's when we discovered that she'd got quite potential for athletics. Last year I won six gold medals and I smashed eight national records and also I got this award on Friday for an outstanding athlete. As part of our marketing strategy we have uh, uh, quite involvement in sponsoring organisations both uh, and individuals in the local community and we see that as an opportunity uh, for us to help uh, those people and also gain awareness of the Institute and what we do. Our sponsorship with Holly has run now for two years and we're into the second year and we'll continue that um, over the next coming years because Holly's a really talented athlete and we want to help her get to the Paralympic Games um, in 2012 uh, but also we sponsor her throughout the the season that she competes in athletics across the country and helps us again get our name across. Um, but what we're specifically doing with Holly is giving her some money towards travel and transport arrangements. Uh, we've helped her buy some kit um, that she needs for her athletics and uh, we've also um, helped her with some tracksuits and uh, some training kit. 
Holly's a really inspirational athlete to work with. I first met Holly actually through the Able Bodied Performance Squad where she was the first athlete with a disability to qualify for our, our mainstream programme. Um, she, she came across straight away through that programme and through her time in the UK School Games as an, an athlete with a real can-do attitude. Um, this is the first year we've run a disability performance programme as part of the region's aim to encourage as many athletes as possible to reach the Paralympics in 2012. It's nice to see that other people enjoy disability sports like me because when I was younger I didn't think that it was nothing for disabled anyone and to be like me it's quite an achievement to go to Paralympics and compete because not much people go and have a chance to go into the Paralympics. I come to the Grimsby Institute to um, train on Saturday with him and we do um, very hard work. We do, um, we could do legs for one week and then upper strength for another week. I train hard every Saturday morning or afternoon I work specifically on her upper body within a javelin thrower. I want to strengthen her shoulders, her back, her arms, and also every other week with a cardiovascular work with Holly, like running, power jog, bike, anything that can increase the heart rate. Holly's done quite a lot of titles in the last couple of years. She's really, really good. In fact, she's a lot better than she actually thinks she is. Um, I've had a lot of support from my mum and dad and my family. Um, mum taking me everywhere and also sponsors to get me places like Germany, getting there and back, and also Commonwealth Games in 2010. Hopefully I might be going to Beijing for the Paralympics in 2008, and then 2010, Commonwealth Games, and hopefully 2012. Ollie's progressing really, really well. As far as Ollie's concerned, the sky's the limit. If she puts the effort in, she will get results. It's just a case of push, 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 push. And in, we're looking forward to the next table Olympics where Ollie should be really represent England and she should be really, really well. Well, that's all we've got time for on today's Lincolnshire Living. But remember, the programme is about you and your community. So if you have a story, then get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Our contact details are coming up shortly. Bye for now.